Hello to all of my mighty Marvelites, Dante D here, and welcome to the channel, the podcast where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. Today, we're going to be talking about a really, a topic really of epic proportions, and that is the top 75 Marvel comics of all time. And you're probably asking yourselves right now, why? Why are we going to be talking about the top 75 Marvel comics? And I actually kind of uh, stumbled upon this uh this topic while i was uh reorganizing my uh my comic book vault it's actually my basement <laughs> and uh, i actually stumbled upon uh this and uh, what this is is a uh a marvel magazine that was celebrating the 75th anniversary of marvel comics it's just a one shot uh and this was issued in uh comic book shops for free actually back in 2014 when uh marvel comics was celebrating their 75th anniversary uh, i remember when i got this i was actually f first of all really really surprised that this was being given out for free. Uh, it's actually a really nice magazine. Uh, it's printed in nice quality. Uh, and it, there are a lot of pages in this. And basically uh, what they what they do in this 75th anniversary uh, edition magazine is uh, they kind of talk about Marvel Comics uh, past, present, and, and, and even future. And uh, they go through, you know, a little bit of the history of Marvel. Uh, they talk about crossover events, some of the best comics ever published by Marvel. And then they talk, they did like a little spotlight on some uh, prominent artists that were prominent in 2014 uh, at the time um, this magazine was published. And then they're also talking about the uh, the, the Marvel movies and uh, kind of making it look like how uh, that that the future of Marvel comics really is the uh, the Marvel studios. Uh, but the the article that really kind of uh, caught my attention was the greatest, the 75 greatest Marvel comics of all time. And basically what Marvel did, uh, the, the, all these, these top 75 were actually chosen by fans. And I'll just kind of read this little blurb here. What they... What they write here is earlier this year on marvel.com and through our social media channels we put out the call asking you to help us select the 75 greatest comics in the history of the house of ideas and you came through big time with thousands of responses narrowing down 75 years of the greatest characters and most talented creators did not prove an easy task but with your assistance we believe we came up with a representation uniquely marvel Enjoy 75 fantastic, amazing, incre incredible, uncanny gems from more than seven decades as chosen by you. So this was all these top 75 Marvel comics were chosen by the fans. Uh, if, if you have this magazine, by the way, uh, let me know uh, because uh, I, I, I was in love. This is probably the best free thing I've ever received. <laughs> uh, so we'll just dive right into it. I have to tell you in advance, though, when I was going through this list, uh, I I couldn't believe uh, what was selected, and I think the number one uh, definitely deserves its number one spot. But some of these I didn't even know existed, to be honest. Uh, I am a huge comic book fan. I've been reading comics for a really, really long time, but uh, I can tell you that I still have a lot to read, a lot to read. Uh, lately, I've actually been reading lots of comics. As you, if you've been watching and listening to um, the the channel for a while, you'll know that uh, I'm a huge reader. I love reading comics, but I also like reading novels, particularly Star Wars novels. Uh, now I've kind of taken a pause on the Star Wars novels for a little bit, uh, and uh, now I'm back into reading comic books like crazy. But I'm primarily reading uh, the trades. I just I'm really loving. Uh, the epic collections that uh, Marvel's putting out, as well as the Mighty Marvel Masterworks. Uh, actually, uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the Mighty Marvel Masterworks, but uh, it's a uh, it's a series that is very, very, it's great value. I mean, you're getting like 10, 15 issues of uh, classic Marvel stories for under $20, which is amazing. It's targeted for children, but they're still the classic Silver Age story. So I've, I've been reading a lot of that kind of stuff and, uh, and the epic collections. Just um, love reading classic comics in those types of formats. 
but uh, got off on a little bit of a tangent there. So uh, let's just jump right into this list, starting with uh, number 75. Uh, what they have here is the death of Spider-Man. And this happened in uh, Ultimate Spider-Man issues number 156 to 160. I'll kind of read a little blurb here. The ultimate line has never flinched in the face of big changes and none have been bigger than the death of that universe's Peter Parker in this emotion-filled event. So this happened in uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. And uh, for those of you that uh, aren't really familiar with Ultimate Spider-Man, it's uh, it's kind of like an alternate universe uh, Spider-Man launched and I believe is the, uh, the early 2000s. And uh, people loved it. It kind of just uh, gave a fresh new look on uh, Spider-Man. Wasn't really a huge fan of the art. Um, the cover art anyway in uh, in ultimate spider-man uh, here's here's an image here just i find spidey looks kind of weird but uh fans voted the death i guess because they they killed off peter parker uh i haven't read the actual death uh issues but they killed off peter parker uh in this in this universe and that happened between issues 156 to 160. number 74 uh the next top marvel comic would be next wave Agents of Hate. Uh, and this happened between Next Wave Agents of Hate numbers 1 to 12. If you've read this, please let me know. Uh, have no idea what this is. I didn't even know this, this existed, <laughs> to be honest with you. But uh, what they wrote here is Hate, which is uh, highest anti-terrorism effort, was a group composed of the also-ran likes of Monica Rambeau, Machine Man, and Tabitha Boom Boom Smith in a wicked satire that featured Warren Ellis and Stuart Immonen doing whatever the heck they wanted with a superhero book. Haven't read this. Uh, if you have, let me know. Does it deserve the number 74 spot? Reach out to me in the comments or on social media. Number 73. Uh, the selection here was uh, is New Mutants 98. Now, uh, some people out there right now are probably thinking that number 73, really? This either should have been A, higher on the list, or B, not on the list at all. It really, And that is because, uh, if you know a little bit about comic book history, New Mutants 98 is uh, by Rob Liefeld. And uh, Rob Liefeld has to be probably one of the most polarizing figures in uh, comic books nowadays. I can tell you personally, I am an unironic un un fan of Rob Liefeld. Is he my favorite favorite artist? No, but uh, I uh, I really cannot understate his contributions to the comic book medium at all. Uh, New Mutants ninety eight. Uh, I actually have this issue, and uh, what they write here is Rob Liefeld and um, Fabian. Nicieza, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Sorry if I if I said it wrong. Continued to sow the seeds of X Force with the introduction of Domino and even bigger Wade Wilson, aka Deadpool. Yes, this is the first appearance of uh, of Deadpool. That was in New Mutants '98, probably the most ex one of the most definitely one of the most expensive modern books of all time. Like I said, I do have it, uh, read it. Not a huge fan. I uh, didn't think it was. Uh, one of the greatest introduction issues that I've read. I can't even really tell you what what happened in that. I think I only read it once. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, it is a nice uh, collectible book to have in any in any collection. Uh, but as a as a story, wasn't wasn't really a a huge huge fan of it. But I have to give Rob Liefeld a lot of credit because he definitely turned that book around. Like New Mutants was like a B, probably closer to a C list book um, when he came on it, and he like just. He just brought it to the A-list and beyond. He made it one of Marvel's hottest books. So personally, I definitely think that New Mutants 98 deserved a spot on this list. Uh, whether you like Rob Liefeld or not. So number 72, Marvel 2 and 1 annual number 7. This is another one actually I haven't read. Um, what they write here, what's better than the thing putting on a pair of boxing gloves and duking it out in a bout with the cosmic entity called the champion. How about Colossus, Thor, Hulk, Sasquatch, and other Marvel heroes joining him? This one's all about classic Marvel fun, courtesy of Tom DeFalco and Ron Wilson. I love Tom DeFalco, by the way. Uh, he actually was the EIC editor-in-chief uh, for a while of Marvel Comics, and uh, he had a really, really epic run on Spider-Man. Uh, helped introduce the Green Goblin, or sorry, the Hobgoblin. Uh, Marvel... 
Marvel 2 and 1, I think, was a great title. I haven't read this particular issue, but uh, it sounds like it's a lot of fun. I might have to check that one out. Uh, I actually have the Marvel 2 and 1 Epic Collection on order. I'm going to uh, pick that one up and uh, and read it because I, I love those, those team-up books uh, that Marvel was doing in the late 70s and early 80s, i.e. Marvel 2 and 1 and Marvel Team-Up. Marvel 2 and 1 is kind of like that... Uh, it was a title that showcased the thing usually with uh, some other the thing from Fantastic Four with with some other hero and then Marvel te team up was essentially a Spider-Man book where Spider-Man was teaming up with uh, some other hero in the Marvel universe. In the number 71 spot we have Fantastic Four number 262. What they're saying here is a decision to rescue Galactus from death ushers in the trial of Reed Richards as the universe seeks to penalize Mr. Fantastic for condemning other planets to die. A complex tale by John Byrne that stands at the pinnacle of his epic run. John Byrne Fantastic Four was epic. If you did not pick up John Byrne Fantastic Four or have not read it in any sort of capacity, read it on Marvel Unlimited, pick up the trades, pick up the original issues. I'm sure they're pretty expensive though amazing uh that one there i think i might have read that one once and it's just it's just such a great uh it, it really kind of it's it's a morality kind of like a morality uh and ethics kind of tale kind of makes you question your own morality because reed richards obviously wants to re rescue galactus from death because in the marvel universe of course you know a lot of these heroes don't believe in and their villain and the villain's dying a, because, you know, that's just the type of heroes there are. And B, and if you start killing off all the villains, you're not going to have many comics to write about, right? So, uh, but I think they really kind of take that principle of these heroes saving uh, or not killing these villains and looking at it. They kind of really highlight the fact that by not killing these villains or i.e. by saving them, you're actually creating more problems in the long run. I think that's really great. Uh, that's definitely something uh, that is highlighted a lot in Batman, especially with the uh, many escapes of the of the Joker. Number 70, uh, Daredevil, The Man Without Fear, number one to five. And this is a Frank, Frank Miller work, actually. Uh, Frank Miller returned to Marvel in 1993, to write this prestige limited series recounting Daredevil's origin, drawn by John, dr ugh, drawn by John Romita Jr. in one of the classic works of his career. It's a little bit of a tongue twister there, John Romita Jr. Uh, so Frank Miller, obviously he's a legend in comics, uh, but he was also a legendary Daredevil writer artist. Uh, Probably the best content coming out of Daredevil came from Frank Miller. So he he had that epic run on, uh, on Daredevil where he introduced Elektra. Uh, and then once he was off the book, uh, sales pretty much plummeted on Daredevil. And then they had to bring him back again to do Daredevil Born Again, uh, which was, again, a stellar, stellar Frank Miller run. I actually like the Born Again run better than his uh, his original run. I don't know if that's blasphemy or not. Uh and then again in 1993, they brought him back. Like Frank Miller was the guy that could make Daredevil sell. Apparently, <laughs> I think Frank Miller, just with his grim and gritty style, uh, it, it works really well with a street level character like like Daredevil, who's really kind of you know in the gutters, in the alleys, you know, taking out the these uh, these criminals. So uh, definitely a, a, a great selection there for the number 70 spot. Number 69, uh, we have Avengers number four. This book here, I can't believe is actually only in uh, position 69 or in the 69th spot, but uh, Avengers number four is uh, is the return of Captain America. It's the first Silver Age appearance of Captain America. Legendary cover with uh, by Jack Kirby here. You can see it right here. Uh, and what they have here is the return of the super soldier Steve Rogers found on ice by the Avengers decades after his seeming death in the waning days of World War II. Can this man out of time be Captain America once more? What Marvel did with with Cap uh, in the in the Silver Age, I think, was just was just brilliant. So you're taking this this character from World War II and you're bringing him back, and I mean between 
World War, the end of World War II in the 1960s, I think it was like, you know, 20 something years. And, uh, but a lot, a lot had changed, right? American culture had changed significantly. So, uh, Cap in the 1960s era was essentially an anachronism. He's coming out of the 1930s and 40s. And now you're putting him in a world where, uh, it's foreign to him. And, in the following issues, all he's doing is brooding about him not belonging in this world. And it, it really kind of brought a lot of psychological richness to um, to the superhero archetype in general, but also to, to Captain America. And this is one of the things I feel is kind of really forgotten. You know, everyone looks at Peter Parker as, you know, the everyman hero or the hero with problems. But uh, I feel that Cap, in a way, kind of had some bigger problems than than uh, Peter Parker at the time. Can you imagine being frozen for for that many for that many years, really, and uh, <laughs> coming back and you're in a different world, kind of like uh, a la Demolition Man with Stallone, right? You know, <laughs> except in that movie, he. Uh, he did rather well in the new the new the new time period. Number 68 spot we have Amazing Spider-Man annual number 21. This is the famous wedding issue between uh Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson and I think I could say with some measure of accuracy that Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson are the comic book couple. They're probably everybody's favorite comic book co couple, so it's no surprise that their wedding would be on this list. This is what they write here. Wedding bells rang in 1987 for the event of the year, the union of Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson, and they lived happily ever... Uh, never mind. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and... Uh, I don't mean to spoil it for everyone, but the marriage between Peter Parker and Mary Jane did not last. It lasted a while, uh, but uh, they eventually had to uh, to reverse that marriage and end it in a much reviled tale uh, by Marvel called One More Day. Uh, but we won't really get into that because I'm sure I'll be really surprised if that one's on this list. I, I went through this uh, ahead of time, but uh, I can't really remember everything that's on here. I don't remember that that one more day being on here. If it is, again, I'll, I'll be super surprised. Um, moving on to number, where the heck are we now? 60, uh, 67. This is X-Factor number 87. What they write here is, in one of the most novel stories of his legendary career, writer Peter David examines the X-Factor team through Psychologist Doc Sampson's eyes with inspired visuals provided by new uh, series artist Joe Quesada. Peter David, uh, legend in comics, uh, amazing run on on uh, on Hulk. He's known for his Hulk run, uh, but also some amazing runs on X Factor, clearly, and uh, an Aquaman for DC. Uh, I haven't read this one. Uh, might have to check it out. Let me know. Uh, let me know if you've uh, if you've read this one. I uh, sounds kind of interesting. Uh, Especially with Doc Samson. I think Doc Samson's a really, really cool character. Number 66, Thor. Number 362. Uh, I think that's the Walt Simonson era of Thor. Uh, and before before I even read the little blurb they have here on uh, Thor number 362, I can already tell you Walt Simonson had a legendary run on, uh, on Thor. Probably one of the best runs on Thor to this day. So, uh, yeah. Here's what they're writing here. His fiercest foe, his staunchest ally? In the second of two standout issues from Simonson's run to make the list, Thor received unexpected aid from Scourge, the executioner, who held back the very forces of Hell itself so an Asgardian army could escape Hela's cold grasp. Never was a tale of heroic sacrifice more surprising or more glorious. Number 65, <laughs> I was actually surprised to see this one on here. Number 65, they have the Clone Saga. Uh, now, in general, the, the, the comic book community, I would say, thinks the Clone Saga sucked uh, for Spider-Man. I actually have the trade somewhere on the shelf there. I, ha I haven't read them yet, but uh, uh, I, I plan, obviously plan to. Uh, but the Clone Saga essentially... People thought it sucked because it just went on for too long, and Marvel really tried to milk it. Because initially, it was it was uh, critically praised. Uh, people loved the Clone Saga, but then they just kept it going and going and going way too long. 
and uh, I went from 1994 to 1996, like two years to to tie up an event. Like that's whoa, too long. They're right here in a mega run. <laughs> that's an understatement. In a mega run that included just about every darn Spider-Man comic from 1994 to 1996, the Clone Saga was a love it or leave it proposition for Spidey fans. Very true. Its enduring appeal shows that a lot of folks loved it, including clone counterparts Ben Riley and Kane. So uh, I've actually spoken to a lot of people. Uh, I obviously I was, I was too young when they were doing this. I've spoken to some people who have read the trades and the omnibuses and they say it actually works better as a one cohesive story as opposed to, you know, spread out among uh, multiple, multiple issues. Number uh, 64. Welcome back, Frank. And this runs from the uh, 2000, the 2000 Punisher series, uh, number one to 12. The edgy Marvel Knights imprint gave Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon the freedom to do what they do best. The pair delivered a new Punisher for an era replete with over-the-top action and violence and set in a generally self-contained universe that allowed Frank Castle the flexibility to do what he does best. Uh, I know Garth Ennis is a legendary Punisher uh, creator. Uh, I haven't read this one in particular, though. So if you have read that one, let me know. Number 63, The New Mutants by Chris Claremont, specifically the uh, first 54 issues of the New Mutants run. Now, the New Mutants made their first appearance in a New Mutants graphic novel, uh, one-shot graphic novel that uh, Marvel released in comic book shops in the early 1980s. Did so well that they gave the New Mutants their own title. And, of course, this was great. Chris Claremont was just killing anything mutant uh, back in the 70s and 80s and uh, after he left unfortunately the quality went a little bit it declined a little bit uh until rob liefeld took over and made the book the hot commodity that we know it as today so in the little blurb here they write in the wake of x-men's runaway success mutant maestro claremont matriculated a fresh class of students at xavier school for gifted youngsters the long-running 80s drama starring sunspot magic mirage moonstar cannonball wolfsbane and their friends made for gripping reading uh number 62 marvel comics number one it all started here the timely first appearances of the Human Torch and the Submariner in a creatively in creatively edgy stories that still have bite seventy five years later. Marvel Comics number one is is the comic that started it all for Marvel Comics. Uh, back then, of course, um, Marvel was not called Marvel; it was called Timely Comics. But uh, nevertheless, that was the first book they ever did, and uh, they gave us Torch and uh, with a Submariner. So. Uh, Awesome book. Uh, I actually haven't read the original issue, but uh, the the cover has been been swiped so many times uh, in in the years. It's just a, such an iconic cover. Take a look at it here. Uh, moving on, uh, number sixty one, Silver Surfer. That again, I can't talk today for some reason. <laughs> Silver Surfer Parable, uh, and this is Silver Surfer number one to two. Uh, all they write here is Stan Lee. Mobius, Silver Surfer, Nuff said. I don't know what that's about. I've, I've never read this one. But Stan Lee's in there, along with Mobius and Silver Surfer. And then they say Nuff said. So I guess you don't really have to uh, <laughs> elaborate beyond that. Number 60, Marvel Zombies. Hmm, Marvel Zombies. Uh, obviously, this, this was a limited series from the uh, mid-2000s. Uh, number, this stretches from Mar Marvel Zombies number one to five. Uh, this was during the time when zombies were just super, super popular. You know, Walking Dead and all that stuff. I think Robert Kirkman actually did this one. Uh, and what they write here is The Walking Dead's Robert Kirkman. Yeah, exactly. Ro Robert Kirkman did it. So they write, uh, The Walking Dead's Robert Kirkman was just the man to take a tongue-in-cheek coinage uh, for Marvel fandom and turn it into a justifiable phenomenon. With parody covers by Artham Soydum, phantasmagoric art by Sean Phillips, and uh, rendering and consuming of human flesh by your favorite Marvel heroes, Marvel Zombies was the comic you never knew you wanted until it bit... <laughs> it, it, it bit you in your wallet. 
Love that. I've read Marvel Zombies. I have the trade, actually. It's fun. Uh, I don't think it's essential Marvel reading, but it's fun. It And at the time, it was a legendary, legendary run uh, in comics. Uh, I, uh, this, this comic to this day actually still has quite a great following. Um, and by the way, I should probably mention at this time, if you're interested in picking up any of these uh, trades of any of, uh, of the, the Marvel comics that we're talking about today, uh, you definitely can look at the link in the description to pick up any of your own copies. Uh, yeah, for the ones that I have read, uh, I can tell you, uh, I can recommend most of them. Uh, and for the next one, which is the number 59 position, uh, it's Iron Man Armor Wars. Uh, this stretches from Iron... It goes from Iron Man 225 to 231. I haven't read this one. Not a huge Iron Man fan, to be honest. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we here it is. And it says, uh, Tony Stark is the world's greatest weapons developer. But what happens when his deadliest technology winds up in the hands of a cabal of supervillains? Armor Wars is what happens. A latter-day classic from the team of David Michelini and Bob Layton. Number 58, The Kang Dynasty. Here's another one actually I haven't read. Uh, this is uh, from the 1998 Avengers, uh, issues number 41 to 55. Another run from uh, Buziek era of Avengers makes the tally. This one, the Kang epic to end all Kang epics. An all-out assault by the world's would-be time-traveling conqueror with the Avengers on the front line. Number 56, uh, Alpha Flight. Good to see Alpha Flight actually getting some love here. I'm, I'm really happy people voted this one in, but this was Alpha Flight number 12. John Byrne shocked the world, especially the part of, uh, of it north of the U.S. border with the tragic death of longtime Alpha Flight Commander Guardian. Uh, I actually have this issue, and uh, I read... I actually have most of the... Most, most of the first 30 or so issues of, of uh, Volume 1 of Alpha Flight. And I have to say, it was great, great run uh, by John Byrne. I am a little biased because I am Canadian, but uh, nevertheless, it still was a great run. Highly recommend reading it, picking it up. I'm actually waiting for them to uh, to collect the Alpha Flight issues in some sort of epic collection or something like that. Uh, if you know anything about that, let me know. But uh, from the research I've been doing, I don't think there have been any plans to collect Alpha Flight in any sort of uh, omnibus or uh, epic collection anytime soon. But hopefully they do in the future. Uh, yeah, Guardian, who's also known as the uh, Vindicator. Uh, great character. Really like his costume. He's kind of like... Um, He's kind of like a Canadian Captain America. At least that's the kind of the vibe he gives. Uh, but yeah, he was he was dead. I can't believe they killed him off after 12 issues. It was great. Great work. World War Hulk, oh, of course. World War Hulk is one of the... Um, one of the most memorable Hulk stories by, uh, by Greg Pak. And uh, just such great work there. Uh, so, World War Hulk, number one of five, obviously. Lasted five issues. In this senses shattering sequel to Planet Hulk, John Romita Jr. and Greg Pak deliver on the Hulk's revenge fantasy against an Earth that betrayed him. The green skinned Goliath has never been unleashed like this. Pick that up if you haven't. <laughs> oh, sorry, I missed one. Number 57. I'm going to have to go back a little bit here. Uh, number 57. The way they're kind of numbered here is kind of weird, but uh, number 57 is Amazing Spider-Man number 129. I can't believe that's that's only number 57, but Amazing Spider-Man number 29, number 129 is the first appearance of Punisher, obviously. And here's what they write. Who is this tough-as-nails vigilante bent on assassinating our friendly neighborhood Spidey? Why, that would be Frank Castle making his very first appearance as the Punisher. One of the most sought-after Spider-Man issues of all time, definitely. And uh, definitely recommend picking up at least the trade because it is a great story. Have this one and uh, definitely love it. Now going back to number 54, Wolverine by Chris Claremont and Frank Miller. This would be uh, Wolverine Volume 1. It was a limited series from the early 1980s. Uh, and this was uh, Wolverine 1982 numbers 1 to 4. It was only a four-issue series. Uh, but then I think the, some of that story carried over into the X-Men uh, where Wolverine goes to Japan and he, and he marries... Um, don't remember that character's name now uh, but she was like some sort of like yakuza daughter or something like that but anyway uh it just writes uh, they write here frank miller chris claremont wolverine and ninjas was more than x-men fans of the early 80s could have asked for 
what they got was every bit the classic an assembly like that could promise with a japan-based story that added exciting new dimensions to the saga of wolverine <laughs> i definitely pick it up love love this run uh, it's amazing number 53 uh avengers disassembled and this is uh avengers number 500 to 503 and avengers finale number one they write here this is it the fountainhead from which much of the post-2004 narrative of the Marvel Universe has flowed. Brian Michael Bendis brought terror to Avengers Mansion, and David Finch made it look oh so beautiful. Lives were lost, and the direction of Earth's Mightiest Heroes was forever changed. Haven't read this one. Uh, I might have to check that one out, though. Spot number 52, where Marvel it was talking about Thor, God of Thunder by Jason Aaron and Isad Rivich. Uh, I actually haven't read this one, but uh, they talk uh, th this particular storyline stretched between Thor it was a uh, Thor God of Thunder number numbers one to eleven, and they write past, present, and future. Thors are put to the test against the God Butcher, a nihilistic force bent on killing every immortal he can get his tendrils around. Aaron and Rivich bring their A-game to a new era of Thor. I actually did hear that uh, Jason Aaron's run on Thor is very good. So uh, I'm guessing I should, uh, should probably check it out. Moving on to number spot 51, Deadpool Kills. Uh, and this collects Deadpool, Deadpool Kills, the Marvel Universe number one to four, Deadpool Illustrated number one to four, and Deadpool Kills Deadpool number one to four. And I haven't read this one actually, but uh, everything Deadpool I feel is really popular among Marvel fans. So it's no surprise that a few Deadpool selections would appear on this type of list. So Deadpool Kills, what they're writing here is Cullen Boone's Killology features Deadpool as you've never seen him, slaughtering his way across the Marvel Universe, slaying some of the most cherished characters in literature, and then, of course, because it's so Wade Wilson, killing multiple alternate re reality versions of himself. Definitely um, a la uh, Ryan Reynolds. Uh, this is reminds me of something kind of like what we saw in the Deadpool movie where uh, Ryan Reynolds just goes through and even kills alternate reality versions of himself, which I thought was hilarious. In spot number 50, we have uh, the original Avenger Avengers run, uh, specifically though number 57. And that, of course, is the first appearance of Vision with this awesome, awesome legendary cover by uh, John Buscema. Uh, and here they write comics simply do not come as poetically beautiful as behold the vision by Roy Thomas and John Buscema, a classic highlighted by the first appearance of the avenging Android. Uh, I, John Buscema and Sal Buscema, his brother are actually, uh, some of my favorite artists from the time period. Uh, I feel John Buscema kind of gets, um, he gets a little bit of the crap end of the stick just because he was uh, Jack Kirby's contemporary and he's off, often overshadowed by uh, Jack Kirby. But uh, I, I just love Bushama's stuff and uh, on, on Avengers and even on Conan the Barbarian. He just was a very, very talented artist. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but um, I, I, his, uh, his brother Sal is actually still around. Number 49, Hawkeye by Matt Fraction and David Asia. This is actually a, uh, a newer book. Uh, I actually think this was from 2014, but it was probably one of the most original runs on Hawkeye that I've ever read. And they write arguably the most endearing book from recent vintage Marvel. Fraction and Asia place Hawkeye in a Brooklyn apartment building where he becomes a neighborhood champion. An Eisner award-winning showcase for Clint Barton, but no less so for co-star Kate Bishop and a rescue dog named Lucky, a.k.a. Pizza Dog. I read this one and it was uh, it was a lot of fun, actually. Very, very original take on the Hawkeye character, for sure. Number 48, Giant Size X-Men, number one. I thought this actually would be higher up in the list, but nevertheless, here it is. Giant Size X-Men is probably one of the most sought-after uh, Bronze Age issues ever. And it's definitely one of the most collectible and one of the most expensive 
the X-Men as we know them today, you ask anybody, you know, who who do you think of when you think of the X-Men? You, you know, people are going to say Cyclops, Storm, uh, Nightcrawler, Wolverine. And before this issue, the X-Men did not look like that. The X-Men were essentially just Iceman, uh, the, the Beast, Cyclops, Angel, Jean Grey, right? And then when Claremont came on, he started me- mixing things up and... You know, the first time we saw the X-Men as we know them today was in this, this issue here, Giant Size X-Men number one, which was also the first appearance of many characters like uh, Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, I think a few others. This unfortunately was not the first appearance of Wolverine. I actually believe this was maybe the third appearance of Wolverine, Uh, but nevertheless, definitely a big book. And they write here, the all new, all different X-Men burst forth into the Marvel Universe in this instant classic by Len Wein and Dave Cockrum, featuring the first assemblage of Wolverine, Banshee, Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, and Thunderbird. The new team is sent on a death-defying mission to save Cyclops and the classic X-Men. In the number 47 spot, uh, it's another Avengers run. It's the uh, Korvac saga. And that ran from Avengers number uh, 170 to 177. They write here, Jim Shooter uh, presages his secret wars with this all-time Avengers classic, pitting the Avengers and the Guardians of the Galaxy against the cosmic might of Korvac. Actually, I've not read this one. I'm going to have to pick this one up. I actually heard really, really uh, good things about it. So that's the Korvac saga. Number 46 spot is amazing spider-man 700 (laughs) i love this one uh this is actually one of probably one of my personal favorites on the list uh if uh if you've read this one you know what i'm talking about this is the issue where doc ock is dying and he switches his consciousness he, he puts his consciousness into peter parker and puts peter parker's consciousness into his dying body doc ock dies and so does effectively Essentially, also, Peter Parker dies as well. And from then on, we get the Superior Spider-Man. So the Amazing Spider-Man stopped publication for a while, and then it became the Superior Spider-Man for about 32 or so uh, issues before, of course, they brought Peter Parker back. But uh, it, it was, I remember, this was, a, this was a great book. I loved it. And uh, it, was, it was a crazy time in, in Spider-Man, for sure. Uh, they write here, the master plan and the making for 100 issues comes to fruition as Dr. Octopus, Dying Wish comes true but the death of spider-man is only the beginning writer dan slot and artist umberto ramos unveil the newest hero in town otto octavius the superior spider-man uh i have to say i'm not a big fan of um of umberto ramos's art i find it really kind of uh, juvenile and kind of makes spider-man look weird i know uh, giuseppe Camuncoli uh actually uh was a returning artist quite a few times on this and i do like his art but um they used ramos a bit too much didn't like it but uh i really like the way dan slot wrote spider-man so uh i was still able to really really enjoy it number 45 spot astonishing x-men by joss Whedon and john cassidy and this uh this runs from astonishing x-men number one to 24 and giant size astonishing x-men number one haven't read this one actually uh and what they're writing and uh what they write here about this book is a saga so astonishing the whole run makes the list Whedon and Cassidy achieved countless moments of perfection, including the emotional return of Colossus. Ooh, that sounds pretty, pretty cool. Might have to check that out. I have to say though, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the X-Men. I've read a lot of X-Men, but I'm not, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, don't know why. Uh, they just never were my cup of tea. And then 80s X-Men, uh, holy crap, you want to talk convoluted and difficult to follow? Uh, 80s X-Men, if you didn't like read every single issue, you could get lost. Uh, there was just so much going on in uh, in the X-Men, right? So uh, number 44, Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, this is the 1999 uh, version. Uh, technically Amazing Spider-Man Volume 2. And this is Amazing Spider-Man number 36. And this is the famous black cover. There it is right here. Uh, and um, this is the 9-11 commemorative issue. And I have this one. And it was a sad. It was sad. Uh, very, very... Just to that, that full landscape page. They have two pages. It's just a landscape picture of Spider-Man in front of Ground Zero where the Twin Towers are all in rubble. And he's just like, oh my goodness. And... It's just such a compelling uh, 
image and it's so sad and evokes so much emotion that uh yeah just thinking about it kind of gives me gives me chills a bit but um it says the day was 9 11 and the twin towers of the world trade center were brought down by acts of unspeakable evil and there was nothing spider-man could do about it j michael strachinsky and john romita jr ruminate about the feelings of helplessness and acts of heroism brought about by the terrible events of that day uh i was uh maybe 13 or 14 when 9 11 happened so i'm i remember it quite a bit i was actually in school when it happened and uh just uh you know everybody's world changed that day and uh i'm, I'm really glad that the the comic book companies did something uh to to call attention to that uh to that tragedy for sure uh, in spot number 43, we have Amazing Spider-Man number 50. This is the original original run of Amazing Spider-Man right here. Uh, that is the first appearance of the Kingpin. But uh, the fact that this is the first appearance of the Kingpin is not why I think they, they made this book or why people love this book so much. It's, it's actually the story. The story is really, really good in this. And it says, it's the Spider-Man No More story. With so much responsibility surrounding his life as a wall-crawling hero, it was inevitable Peter Parker would face the ultimate crisis of faith. Can he remain Spider-Man? The answer in this issue, according to Stan Lee and John Romita Jr. Sr., is a tragic no. Number 42, the ultimate number one. The ultimate line had already struck gold with updated versions of Spider-Man and the X-Men. There was only one place to go after that, Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Mark Miller and Brian Hitch introduced Captain America and Iron Man to the fold in this widescreen first issue. Uh, I haven't read this one. Actually, that was my probably my least favorite era of Marvel uh, comics. Any comics written between like 1996 and, nine, and 2006, seven. uh I haven't really looked at this that, that that kind of uh embodies the bill jemis joe casada era better known as the um casada or sorry the uh quemus area era and uh it just um not not my favorite era in comics uh definitely not i didn't didn't like a lot that was coming out of uh, marvel at the time uh, i mean but they were th it was a time when they were really kind of trying to reinvent themselves because they were coming out of bankruptcy, right? I mean, Marvel declared bankruptcy in 1996 and they essentially didn't know what the heck they were going to do at that point. So they were trying to re, re, reestablish their identity as a company, I think. Right. So, uh, number 41 planet Hulk, uh, and this ran from incredible Hulk number 92 to number one Oh five. Uh, I think that's volume two of the Hulk. Uh, great. This is probably one of the most memorable Hulk runs of all time by Greg Pak. Definitely. Uh, if, if you're looking, but, and by the way, if you're looking for any of these today, I will link some of the, the best of these Marvel comics in the description. If you're looking to read any of these runs today. Uh, and what they say here is Hulk epics do not get any more epic than this. Writer Greg Pak exiles the Jade Giant to a far-flung planet, courtesy of the Illuminati, where he gathers a band of compatriots on his journey from slave to king. And finally, in the aftermath of ultimate tragedy, Earth's worst nightmare. It's, it's really good. <laughs> You've really got to check it out. Spot number 40, Fantastic Four number 285. Uh, haven't read this one either. One of the gems of Secret Wars 2 is this poignant lesson in what it means to be a hero in the face of tragedy. For more than two decades, Johnny Storm had played the part of Sue's kid brother, but in this encounter with his ill-fated biggest fan and the Beyonder, the Human Torch was forced to grow up. Uh, this sounds really cool. Uh, not going to lie. Might have to check that out. Have you read it? Let me know. Number 39, Captain America, number 25. This is the 2004 Captain America. Famous cover right here. Uh, so the, the, the death of Captain America, right? Ed Brubaker's masterpiece continues with the death of Captain America. Drawn by Captain America, stalwart Steve Epting. Sharon Carter, the Falcon, and all of America are plunged in chaos by the assassination of steve rogers well of course we all know that steve rogers is alive and well <laughs> in comics today so uh don't worry he doesn't stay dead 
nobody usually does in comics, right? Number 38, The Kree slash Scroll War. What does this seminal saga not have? Roy Thomas and Neil Adams pull out all the stops with Cosmic Warfare, Captain Marvel, Black Bolt, and the in and the Inhumans, Ant-Man's fantastic voyage, Inside the Vision, the return of Marvel's greatest Golden Age heroes, and Scroll Cows. Wow, that was just a really weirdly written blurb. <laughs> anyway, that ran from Avengers 89 to 97. Number 37 spot is Thunderbolts, number one. It's from 1997. Arguably the most surprising last page reveal in Marvel history. Kurt Busiek and Mark Bagley stayed, started a sensation with this tale of a vacuum of heroes being filled by opportunistic villains. Can evil save the day? Sounds interesting. Uh, that's Thunderbolts, number one. Have you read it? Let me know in the comments. Are you agreeing with you so far? Definitely like to hear from you. Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. by Jim Steranko. This ran from Strange Tales number 151 to 168. And Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. number 1 to 3 and number 5. Marvel's hard-nosed super spy starred in some of the coolest, sleekest, most cutting-edge comics of the 60s thanks to writer-slash-artist extraordinaire Jim the Man Steranko. The Marvel Age of Comics did not get any hipper than this. I agree, actually. I have the Steranko run of uh, of Nick Fury. Really, really good. Some of the most interesting art I've seen. Really psychedelic. Uh, just really great work. The stories are amazing, too. Uh, a lot of people at the time, actually, this was during like that hippie era, and a lot of uh, hippies and younger people in their teens and college students, they were reading... Uh, Steranko's work and seeing it and they actually thought he was on an acid trip <laughs> while he was doing his art here and to my knowledge I don't think Steranko was ever a you know into drugs but uh, nevertheless his stuff looked really really cool and psychedelic highly recommend reading it for sure number 35 amazing spider-man uh, number 31 to 33 this is probably one of the most amazing uh, sorry one of the most memorable runs uh, on spider-man we we all know these these beautiful images uh, this is near the end of uh, Steve Ditko's tenure on spider-man but it says here uh, the timeless throwdown between Spidey and the mysterious master planner now who could that be had the highest stakes imaginable for our hero, the life of Aunt May, featuring the most iconic moment of great power from the early days of Spider-Man. If this be my destiny remains a Lee Ditko masterpiece. I totally agree. Love it. Uh, I actually have the original issues of this, which are really good. Uh, and then I also have it collected in uh, Omnibus and the Amazing Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 1. Fantastic work. Just probably some of the best work in comics to this day. Number 34, Ultron Unlimited. And this uh, ran from the 1998 uh, run of Avengers from 19, issue 19 to 22. The Avengers were ascendant in the late 90s thanks to Kurt Busiek and George Perez. They also unleashed the deadliest iteration of Ultron yet, poised to commit global genocide and rebuild Earth in his own robotic image. Number 33, Avengers versus X-Men. Cyclops will go to any lengths to keep hope from harm, even if it means taking on the power of the Phoenix itself. With the mutant messiah caught in the middle, a deadly clash erupts between the X-Men and Avengers, and Professor X pays the ultimate price. Avengers versus X-Men, I have to say, when it first came out, uh, I bought all the original issues, and I thought it was amazing. It, it, it was great. I actually read it for the second time collected as a trade paperback and I didn't like it as much. I think I kind of saw it for what it was. And that was just, uh, that was an event that I feel Marvel just kind of pulled out of their, out of their, out of their butts just to kind of boost their sales. Because at the time, uh, DC was actually killing it in the sales charts 
for comic books with their uh, new 52 initiative. So Marvel really had to do something. I feel like Avengers versus X-Men was uh, their response to that. But anyway, the second time around, I didn't enjoy it as much. Uh, I actually sold my issues of this. Uh, and then I read the trade and eh, it, it's okay. Uh, I, I'm surprised it's actually ranked that high. Let me know what you thought. Have you read Avengers vs. X-Men? Uh, let me know in the comments what you thought about it. Number 32, X-Men, Fatal Attractions. Okay, so there are many different uh, issues here. So this ran in X-Factor number 92, X-Force 25, Uncanny X-Men number 304, and the 1999, 1991 X-Men number 25, Wolverine number 75, and Excalibur number 71. In one of the biggest wow moments, in Wolverine's history, Magneto did the unthinkable and stripped the adamantium from Logan's skeleton. Andy Kubert's visuals and Xavier's stunning response paved the way for Onslaught. Number 31. This is Thor, number 337. Uh, this is Walt Simonson Thor. And I don't know if I've mentioned, but Walt Simonson's Thor was probably the best run on Thor ever, ever. It's one of the most memorable runs of the 80s, one of the most memorable runs on Thor, probably one of the most memorable runs in comics. But um, right here, Walter Simonson writes, draws and inks a Thor classic, reinvigorating a moribund series with a fearless new take on Asgard. Simonson and his ace in the hole, letterer John Workman, introduced a new hammer wielder by the name of Beta Ray Bill. Number 30. Ooh, I love this one. Incredible Hulk number 181. <laughs> I love this issue. Uh, it is the first appearance of Wolverine. Uh, and the, pro the, the most valuable Bronze Age issue ever. The most collectible Bronze Age issue ever. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just amazing. Love the cover art of this. And uh, I just love everything about this comic. It's amazing. A new hero crashes a fight in the Canadian wilderness between the Hulk and Wendigo in this story by writer Len Wein and artist Herb Trimpey. His name was Wolverine and he was never heard from again. Really? <laughs> no, actually, he was heard from again. I think they're just they're just teasing you here, right? Number twenty nine, Extremis. This ran uh, in the two thousand five Iron Man uh, run from issues number one to six. I haven't read this one actually. A more important, more durable, more definitive tale from Marvel's modern era can't be found on this list. Warren Ellis and Adi Granov not only reinvented the look and feel of the Iron Man armor but also redefined the man inside, thrilling readers and setting the stage for Marvel's worldwide box office takeover. Cool. Number 28, Spider-Man Blue. Uh, this ran in issues uh, one to six, Spider-Man Blue one to six. Part of Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale's color series, along with Daredevil, Yellow, and Hulk Gray, this sensitively told and lovingly drawn and colored story recaptures the innocence and tragedy of Peter Parker's love affair with Gwen Stacy. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't have anything with Spider-Man and Gwen Stacy uh, is, is amazing in Marvel. Foreshadowing. Keep that in mind. Number 27, Maximum Carnage. This ran in Spider-Man Unlimited, number one to two, Web of Spider-Man 101 to 103, Amazing Spider-Man 378 to 380, Spider-Man 35 to 37, and Spectacular Spider-Man 201 to 203. Cletus Cassidy is off his leash in this Spider-Man mega event, joined on a killing spree by Doppelganger, Carrion, and Demo Demogoblin? I actually haven't even heard of them, okay. Uh, Carnage can only be brought down by the combined efforts of Spider-Man and a team of heroes that includes Captain America, Deathlock, and Venom. Wait a second. Venom's one of the good guys? <laughs> That's awesome. Number 26, House of M. Actually, I haven't even heard of that. Wow. Okay. House of M, number one to eight. From the rebel of Avengers Mansion in the aftermath of Avengers Disassembled, Brian Michael Bendis built the House of M, an alternate reality brought about by an insane Scarlet Witch. The climax of this pivotal tale in Marvel history comes with her three simple words, 
No more mutants. Amazing. Just amazing. Number 25, The Death of Captain Marvel. Just amazing here. Love, love this love this cover here, too. Uh, Marvel inaugurated its line of tabloid-sized graphic novels with Jim Starlin's elegant tribute to Marvel in the last courageous battle of his life. A remarkable entry on this list, not just for its storytelling, but also because the death has lasted. I think that's a, probably the only time a death has lasted in comics, right? Warlock by Jim Starlin. Oh, the great Bronze Age stuff right here. Jim Starlin's Warlock. This ran in Strange Tales 178 to 181 and Warlock 9 to 15. Having already spanned the stars with Captain Marvel, Jim Starlin upped the ante by exploring the scope of the soul with Warlock. The self-contained epic has it all. The Infinity Gems, Thanos, and a classic team-up with Spider-Man, The Thing, and The Avengers. What more can he ask for, right? Like, wow. Number 23, The Galactus Trilogy. Uh, amazing run and Fantastic Four. If you haven't read it, definitely recommend uh, picking it up. So many amazing stories coming out of the Silver Age. Uh, the Silver Age of Marvel was just such a magical time in comics. I wish I would have been around at the time to uh, to experience that. Uh, and that ran from Fantastic Four number issues 48 to 50. A complex morality play that introduced Galactus and the Silver Surfer to the Lexicon. The Galactus Trilogy was the Lee Kirby saga that let comic comics readers know once and for all that Marvel was playing for keeps. Definitely. Number 22, Age of Apocalypse. For four months in 1995, X-Universe titles were replaced by limited series set in this alternate reality. Despite the continuity chaos, perhaps even because of it, this undeniably impactful saga and creative high point in X-Men gave rise to a world that found mutants ascendant. The only problem, it was a rule, a world ruled by apocalypse. Number 21, X-Men, God Loves, Man Kills. I have this graphic novel and it's really good. It actually, um, it was served as the basis, I believe, for the second X-Men movie. Uh, the, the theme of bigotry is really front and center. Uh, in this graphic novel. Really good. It was a one-shot, um, kind of oversized. Really great. Uh, an evergreen story from the middle years of Chris Claremont's run. This beautifully rendered work by artist Brent Anderson and colorist Steve Olaf uh, belied the tragedy at the heart of the tale as William Stryker led a crusade of hate against X-Men. Now we're in the top 20. We have to finish it. We got to get to the end. So stick with me, people. Number 20, Secret Invasion. This was in uh, Secret Invasion number 128. Who do you trust? In 2008, no one could be trusted thanks to a shape-shifting Skrull invasion that took over some of the most well-placed heroes in the Marvel Universe. The tension brought to bear by Brian Michael Bendis and uh, Lionel Francis Yu produced one of the most thrilling crossover events in Marvel history. Daredevil number 181. Everyone knows this one. This is the death of Elektra. And wow, uh, Frank Miller's run on Daredevil was just stellar. Uh, definitely deserves this uh, number 19 spot. Uh, Frank Miller's run on Daredevil had brought pain and misery to the man without fear. But the death of Elektra at the hands of his arch enemy Bullseye would push him to the darkest depths of all. Definitely one of the best runs in comics. Uh, some of... Uh, Frank Miller's best work. Frank Miller on Daredevil is just stellar. Again, I said it before, but um, Frank Miller's style, I think, just complements the Daredevil character perfectly. Number 18, Avengers Under Siege. This ran from Avengers 270 to 277. Baron Zemo's Masters of Evil truly lived up to their name in Roger Stern's harrowing narrative. Never before had the Avengers faced as excruciating a defeat, but never before had they risen up from such depths to claim victory. The art team of John Buscema and Tom Palmer gave this story a classically epic touch. Uh, number 17, The Kid Who Collected Spider-Man. This was Amazing Spider-Man number 248. Definitely a, a, a memorable sp Spider-Man story. I know uh, every time you Google best Spider-Man stories of all time, this one always comes up. It was just a backup story, but Roger Stern and Ron Friends' tale of true heroism touched the hearts of all who read it. 
keep a box of tissues handy for this one. It, it is really sad, actually. I have to, I have to admit. <laughs> Number 16, Annihilation. A sprawling cosmic epic spread across series starting Dra- starring Drax the Destroyer, Nova, Silver Surfer, Super Skrull, and Ronan the Accuser. Annihilation was the masterpiece that kick-started a cosmic revival at Marvel. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. That was that was actually really good. Hulk number one. This is in spot number 15. And honestly, it just warms my heart to see Hulk, the original run on Hulk, so high up on this list because uh, Hulk's actually one of... I love Spider-Man, but Hulk's one of my favorite Marvel characters. And uh, just to see where he came from, like the original Hulk run was only six issues and it got canceled. And... You know, now Hulk has risen to become one of the most popular comic book entities and comic book comic book characters of all time. Uh, Lee and Kirby borrow the form of an Atlas era monster and give him the function of a complex hero for the Marvel Age. The rage of weakling Bruce Banner begets the world crushing Gamma Goliath known as the Incredible Hulk. Incredible running comics. Uh, definitely recommend picking up. Um, the original run of Hulk in trade paperback form. Uh, they have an epic collection, actually, that's currently in print, so uh, try to pick it up if you can. It's just beautiful, beautiful. Fantastic Four, number one. Of course, it's the it's in the number 14 spot. Can't believe it's actually not higher, believe it or not. I thought it would be at least in the top 10. Uh, and uh, it gave birth to the Marvel Universe. It definitely deserves a spot in this list. Reed Richards, Susan Storm, Johnny Storm, and Ben Grimm ride a rocket into the cosmic firmament. That sound you hear is the ignition of the Marvel Age, and comics would never be the same. Literally, it. yeah. I'm not the biggest Fantastic Four fan, but uh, I, I cannot under understate or, sorry, I cannot overstate the importance of this comic. It is probably one, aside from Action Comics number one and Detective 27, this is probably one of the most important comics of all time. Avengers number one. All Loki wanted to do was beat his brother. He never suspected his machinations would create the greatest fighting force the world has ever known. Thor, Iron Man, Hulk, Ant-Man, the Wasp. These are Earth's mightiest heroes. And I just love that cover for Avengers number one. Uh, And these stories have so much charm, right? From the Silver Age. Love the Silver Age. Uh, Number 13, Captain America Comics, number one. Uh, One of the few Golden Age books on this list, actually. I think the only other Golden Age book we saw on this list was um, in the previous video. And that was Marvel Comics number one. Uh, Just says, Joe Simon, Jack Kirby, the first appearance of Captain America. Hitler gets punched in the face. This one's got it all. Uh, I actually have not read the first appearance of Captain America. Uh, I've read a lot of the Silver Age stuff, though. And um, I I just think that cover is so iconic, though. Uh, One of the most important covers in comics from the the war era, definitely. Because, you know, Captain America, I think, was meant to be a propaganda character, right? So, uh, just amazing. Secret Wars is uh, is next. And that is the cream of Marvel's heroes. On one side, the worst of its villains on the other. Now go fight. That simple recipe recipes sure made for some big fun. I'm I'm happy that people like Secret Wars as much as they do, and to see it so high up on the, in this list, uh, because Secret Wars actually started off as an initiative to sell toys, uh, believe it or not. And uh, you know, I, I I plan on actually doing a whole episode on Secret Wars because it's such so interesting how it came about but uh nevertheless uh, as it was an initiative to sell toys uh but it's important because it was just a lot of fun a lot of fun to read and uh and on top of that i think it was the first major event in comics you know like i think that's what kicked off the whole uh trend in comics that we even see to this day of like having these giant you know crossover events right even though this wasn't a crossover i think some of the books kind of mentioned it but it it wasn't like a crossover like we know today but uh, it was the first big event i think in comics all right now we are in the top 10 wow okay so uh number 10 amazing fantasy 15 of course beautiful book beautiful book uh first appearance of spider-man uh what more can you ask for and this this tale 
uh, I feel has aged really well. Uh, a young man learns the hard lesson that with great power, there also must come great responsibility in the iconic origin of Peter Parker and Spider-Man by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Number nine, the winter soldier. This was in Captain America, the 2004 run in Captain America, number one to 14. They said Bucky would never return, should never return, but Ed Brubaker and Steve Epting did it anyway. in one of the great cap ec- epics of all time that laid the groundwork for a pair of, for a pair of hit movies yeah uh i actually liked the movies uh the cat movies are really good and captain america's not captain america's not even my favorite character but uh really great movies i have to say uh number eight marvels number one this is alex ross and uh this is the cover swipe i was talking about earlier when we when we talked to, in the previous video about uh, marvel comics number one uh it's a homage definitely to uh marvel comics number one artist alex ross's photorealistic art enlivened enlivened (laughs) writer kurt buziak's love letter to the marvel age of comics an evergreen gem from the early 90s uh marvel's actually really good too uh and you can't get any better than alex ross's art just uh just just gorgeous right number seven the infinity gauntlet uh this is probably the next like super popular crossover series and it served as the basis for of course the super popular avengers movies that came out uh, just a few years ago thanos seeks universal power over mind soul space time and reality through the infinity gems and not even the cosmic heroes of the marvel universe can stop him if you haven't read infinity gauntlet you you need to go out and check it out it's just just amazing great art great story uh and it is slightly different than um then Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. So uh, definitely check it out if you haven't. Uh, Days of Future Past. And this ran in uh, X-Men number 141 and Uncanny X-Men number 142. The Sentinels rule in a dark dystopian future. Mutant kind's only salvation is a trip to the past to change their fate. And the result is a Claremont burn epic for the ages. I have these issues and I've read clearly i've read this story i don't get it uh this is probably the only selection uh on this list that i don't agree with uh and and this is probably my just my unpopular opinion but i, I don't get it uh i don't i I'm sorry it was good but i i don't think it deserves all the hype that uh that it gets for sure the dark phoenix saga this one does deserve all the hype though very very good and definitely one of the most memorable uh runs in comics for sure this ran from uh x-men number 129 to 138 the dark phoenix has destroyed an entire planet killing billions uh and the uh shiar empire has issued the ultimate sanction gene gray must die chris claremont and john byrne tell this seminal moment in x-men history number four born again I'm glad they put Born Again ahead of the original Frank Miller run because Born Again is just so good. Uh, Like I mentioned earlier, after Frank Miller left his original run on Daredevil, the sales just tanked, right? So they ended up bringing him back to do Born Again and he just, uh, he knocked it out of the park again. So uh, hailed as as the definitive Daredevil storyline of all time, David Mazzucchelli draws Frank... Miller's script of Daredevil's ultimate betrayal and utter destruction at the hands of the Kingpin. So good. If you haven't read it, check it out. It's just amazing. Number three, Craven's Last Hunt. Uh, one of the most amazing Spider-Man uh, stories of all time, too. Uh, just really, really good. And it actually ran from, uh, excuse me here, uh, Amazing Spider-Man 239, sorry, 293 to 294, Spectacular Spider-Man 131 to 132, and Web of Spider-Man 31 and 32. Craven has stalked every creature known to man, but the spider has always eluded him. The high stakes hunt ends in one of the most shocking deaths in Marvel history. It's really good. You have to you have to check it out. I love it. Number two, Civil War. Ran from Civil War number one to seven. The Marvel Universe is split down the middle as Iron Man and Captain America represent two sides of an ideological divide that will take all out war to settle. Uh, I liked Civil War. It wasn't my favorite story of all time. I don't think it deserves the number two spot. Um, let me know what you think. 
I would really like to hear why people like it so much. Again, I like it. It's it's amazing, but how do you rationalize and how do you explain civil war coming ahead of you know amazing fantasy 15 or fantastic four number one or you know the dark phoenix saga i just i think it's great i just don't think it deserves the number two spot but hey again that's probably just my unpopular opinion and finally in the number one spot you probably all guessed it because I haven't mentioned it yet, but that is the death of Gwen Stacy. How could we forget the death of Gwen Stacy? We didn't. It's number one, and it deserves to be number one. I totally agree. And, and that ran in Spider-Man number 121 to 122. The tragic death of Gwen Stacy proves that not even Peter Parker's great power and responsibility can protect the ones he loves and enshrines the Green Goblin as Spidey enemy number one. The most iconic, the most memorable comic book story of all time because Gwen Stacy dies no one expected it and <laughs> um she stayed dead for a long time like a really long time we only started seeing her again like a few years ago uh and I don't even think she's the original Gwen Stacy she's just like a Gwen Stacy from a different universe or whatever but um yeah, if you haven't read this, you, you definitely have to check it out. Pick up the trade. Uh, I have the original issues in my collection. So happy to have them. Uh, they're just probably the best, among the best Spider-Man stories of all time and among the best stories in comic books of all time. So that's it. Uh, but those are the top 75 Marvel comics of all time, according to the fans. Uh, and as presented in the 75th anniversary edition of um, Marvel Comics magazine. This was a one-shot. It was printed in 2014. Uh, it was free. You might even have it in your collection. But I, I, when I got this, I was just so happy. And uh, I thought those picks were, were really great. Do you agree with those picks? Do you think that fans of Marvel Comics uh, chose wisely in the top 75 uh, Marvel comics of all time would really love to hear from you all. Once again, you can connect with me in the comments. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're listening to the podcast, thank you for joining me and helping me grow this podcast. Uh, you can connect with me on Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr. Thank you all so much. Once again, for joining me, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you all being here and hanging out with me. Uh, this, this all happens because of you. Until next time, this is Dante D signing off. I will see you all in the next episode.